Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Shivnada Foundation Conversations. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is episode 15 in our ongoing conversations on this platform, where we've tried to bring you some of uh, you know, the most interesting personalities across the world, cutting across sports. We've had PV Sindhu, we've had uh, Chef Ali Talwar, uh, who plays cricket. We've had uh, Shubha Mudgal, the musician. Uh, last week, we had uh, Arun Sareen, the global Indian CEO of Vodafone. Uh, and today, it gives us great pleasure to introduce to you uh, someone who will, I think, engage, entertain, inform all the objectives that I can use uh, over the next 45 minutes. Uh, someone from Boston, Harvard University, uh, Shrikant Datar. Uh, Shrikant is uh, a product of India, grew up in, in India and has been at Harvard since 1996, 24 long years. Uh, he brings with him not only a wealth of academic experience, but he served on the boards of two extremely well-known global uh, life sciences and pharma uh, companies. One is uh, Stryker, the other is Novartis. Uh, he's also been in telecommunications and on the board of T-Mobile. And we're also privileged to have him as an advisor to uh, the Shivnada Foundation as well as to HCL. So uh, welcome, Shrikant. I can see that it is uh, a chilly morning in Boston today. Yes, it is, uh, Saurav. Uh, thank you so much for having me and uh, to the foundation and uh, Shiv and Kiran and Roshni and Shikhar and all that the foundation is doing. This, these conversations are fantastic. And of course, I've known you a long time, so looking forward to uh, uh, you know having this conversation with you. So thank you, Shrikant. So uh, you know, as, you, as I told you, our viewers represent a cross section of people, not just in the foundation and at HCL, but there are viewers uh, from across the globe, uh, you know, representing all walks of life. So we are looking forward to a really entertaining and riveting conversation uh, this morning, your time, and evening hours. Right? Thank you. So, Shrikant, let me start uh, where I think many many of our viewers would be deeply interested in your background. You know, you grew up like like many people in India. You know, middle class India. Uh, you know, in Delhi, your father was in academics. Uh, you uh, you know had a brilliant scholastic record at uh, Bombay University. Uh, went on to IIM Ahmedabad, where you were a gold medalist, which is uh, quite an honor. Uh, and just before I touch upon your transition to the U.S., would you tell us something about your growing up years? What influences, you know, uh, that you encountered? What were the kind of things that, you know, you uh, had as early childhood experiences? So let me uh, sort of uh, do it very quickly, uh, uh, Saurav. And, uh, you know, anytime uh, you get a chance to think about that, it's always the many stories that uh, come to mind. And uh, I'd love to share a few uh, anecdotes and a little bit of background uh, uh, leading up to my uh, going to I am Ahmedabad. Uh, so I consider myself to be extremely lucky. I come from a very uh, close-knit family. Both my grandfathers were doctors. My paternal grandfather was a well-known doctor in my hometown of uh, Miraj, which is in southern Maharashtra, and also an entrepreneur. Um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, my uh, and and as as we had discussed earlier. My maternal grandfather, Dr. C.G. Pandit, was a medical scientist and, uh, as it turns out, a virologist and the founding director of the uh, Indian Council of Medical Research. Uh, he was uh, he received the Padma Bhushan for his contributions to medical science. But what I remember from him, besides, uh, you know, always encouraging us to think creatively and independently, was that he was an amazing human being. He sort of combined this tremendous uh, uh, deep knowledge of science with uh, great humanity. And so I remember most about him, uh, people coming to him with problems and uh, going back with solutions, people coming to him with disappointments and leaving with hope. And so it was a, uh, it was, he was a terrific role model for us uh, growing up. My father was a uh, a freedom fighter in the independence movement and founder of what is now the Lal Bahadur Shastri Nautical and Engineering College, an institution that uh, prepares students to join the Indian Merchant Navy. He taught my brother Gautam and I to be disciplined and to always act honorably with uh, courage and integrity. 
and i remember a very interesting story from my childhood that uh, i still reflect on to this day i must have been 12 or 13 years old and was invited by a friend to a birthday party um, at the race course that's where the party mm-hmm. was being held and we if we wanted to have a little fun betting um, uh, my friend told uh, you know everyone who was invited uh, uh, bring along your own money and uh, you know just for fun and i thought that was a great, great fun idea i was only a, a little boy young boy at the time so i asked my father if he would give me 5 rupees still a lot in those days and certainly uh, you know given our background but not a large amount and since all my friends were bringing uh, money i wanted to join in the fun he quickly and firmly said no i told him very disappointed as i was that uh, then it would be too embarrassing for me to go to the uh, uh, party in that way so i then wouldn't go and he said well that's your decision but uh, let me tell you why i am saying no and he then went on to explain that it was not because he worried that i would lose the money in fact he said if i if he was sure that i would lose he would give me the money in a heartbeat his big worry was that i would win and learn from it a terrible lesson about how easy it was to earn money that way and he said as right. for it's your call now you uh, you're not getting the money so you can decide whether you want to go or not and uh, uh, but let me uh, uh, tell you that if you understand why i am saying no then you should go to the party and he went on to explain that there'll be many times uh, in my life when i might be the only one who takes a particular stand um, and he said when that is the case think about what is right don't just follow what others are doing uh, i went to the party i hung out with a close friend right we won a lot of money but uh, when we went to get ice creams out of uh, you know after all that fun and winning uh, we discovered that his pocket had been picked <laughs> and i learned many lessons that day just i just remember that incident as something that has always influenced how i have uh, Uh, thought and acted you know many many years later my mother was an editor and social worker so uh, again it's a very cerebral household as you said in terms of things but i i think many of these other values that i learned were uh, uh, very important she was a uh, elected member of the uh, pune municipal corporation and uh, uh, you know as part of uh, her work in the constituency she had obtained water connections for every household in the zopatpatti that was part of her constituency so when she passed away in 2005 uh, uh, i was surprised to see many children come to pay their last respects and you know i, I, I asked them i said why are you coming this isn't a place where uh, you know children come and they told me that they were sent by their mothers so and i said that's interesting why did they send you Uh, so they said that you know every morning when i turn on the tap i uh, remember this lady who helped us and today is the last day that you'll ever be able to see her face and so uh, each morning when i now turn on the tap i wanted you to remember uh, who this person was so uh, she really uh, uh, taught us that a life well lived is measured uh, not uh, by what one does for oneself but what one does for others i am very fond of tennis introduced to it uh, by my mother who was a very good tennis player so i go to the us open from time to time and um, wonderful outside outside arthur ashe stadium is this beautiful court uh, from him which says uh, very beautifully and succinctly uh, from what you get you make a living what you give however makes a life wonderful. and that's precisely how she precisely how she asked us to uh, asked us to live as and then you know i went to cathedral and john conan school a fantastic school that i owe a lot to close very close with many of my school friends uh, i studied mathematics and always was in, my father was always interested in uh, me going to the ias and ifs so you know this was all uh, being planned to uh, you know appear for those exams but when i graduated i was below the age limit so i did my chartered accountancy uh still intending to take the competitive exams when i was eligible uh but uh, you know I, i got very interested in management and that uh, of course led me to apply to iim amdavad
So, Shrika, you, you know, sorry, that's a beautiful uh, anecdote about uh, early experience. It's moving and as well as profound. I think uh, the fact that uh, you went through the experiences must have shaped you for the future. But tell us a little bit about uh, your journey thereafter into I am Ahmedabad, of course, where you were a gold medalist. You were a brilliant student from whatever one hears. You know, many of your batchmates still remember you. Uh, what took you? You know, you could have gone from I am Ahmedabad as a gold medalist and pursued, you know, the big box, a career in corporate India, corporate anywhere, right? What took you into academics and then to the U.S.? Uh, what was that journey all about? What was that calling? Was it the heart, the mind, the combination thereof? What took you there? You know, uh, uh, first, of course, uh, going to Ahmedabad uh, sort of was a, a dream come true, uh, extremely uh, uh, competitive place. And I think my uh, experiences at uh, I am Ahmedabad were uh, very formative in, in uh, decisions that I took uh, uh, later. And I think it's just, uh, helpful to just uh, for me to just reflect on that period uh, for a moment as I then uh, get to uh, because it was all part of that uh, kind of thinking that uh, led me there. You know, I was it was such a memorable experience. You know, the idea of uh, uh, case method uh, teaching very much as you know, uh, I am Ahmedabad founded with a lot of support from the Harvard Business School, oh. and so the same set of methods and approaches uh, uh, used there. You know, coming prepared for class, uh, listening and observing uh, and absorbing alternate points of view, uh, taking and uh, defending a stand, learning to make judgments. The teaching quality was truly incredible. And, uh, you know, my fellow students were fantastic uh, in every way. So it was a lot of those uh, uh, f factors that kind of, you know, said, wow, if it's this much fun being a student there, how much fun would it be, um, uh, you know, actually being in, in academia? And uh, of course, certainly influenced by my, my, by my dad, who was, uh, who was an academic. So it, it never really occurred to me that I would, uh, you know, uh, uh, do anything else. I, I, I really thought that uh, I loved the world of ideas and scholarship and research. And um, I also felt that I could perhaps have a greater impact through my writing and uh, than my work, working in the corporate world. Uh, the fact that I love to teach was and still love to teach was a uh, was a big factor. Uh, you know, I'd seen uh, my father and who was also a professor, as you mentioned, and uh, how much he enjoyed teaching. I knew the respect he got from his students and giving them this greatest gift anyone can give, which is their knowledge. Um, and then I got to work on whatever I loved. I had no real boss. Um, I was free to express my views. Um, and so it was just a combination of uh, the experience at Ahmedabad and the uh, uh, opportunities it provided and the excitement about uh, doing more of that, uh, both in terms of uh, research and teaching that then um, sort of you know, uh, propelled me and impelled me to uh, consider a career in academia. And I've never regretted it, sir. No, and, 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 you know, your journey thereafter has been one of enormous, you know, contribution, not just to the area of education, but across a range of areas, right? And before we talk a little bit about, little bit about that, uh, tell us, you know, in, when you went to Stanford, these were the years that there was the early exodus of brilliant Indian minds going there. You know, obviously, you must have got a very generous scholarship because... With your kind of background, and many middle-class Indians could not get to America in those days. They won the resources. Parents didn't have the resources to finance children. Yeah. Uh, were, they, were they years that were difficult, or were they years that you know you were generously funded uh, to be able to pursue your dreams? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean everything uh, sort of at that stage in one's life is uh, is. Uh, uh, always relative, um, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, we, my, my, my wife Swati and I were just married at that time. And so when we were uh, uh, leaving to do our PhD, you know, we had a, we, it was a, it was a reasonable, uh, a reasonable scholarship, but uh, Swati obviously had to work to, um, uh, you know, uh, help us with, uh, uh, with everything that we needed to do at that time in terms of, uh, um, you know, our, our, our living and uh, uh, eating and all the rest of it. So it was generously funded, but not uh, overly generous. I also did a little bit of work at that time. 
but i uh, you know remember it uh, extremely fondly because uh, yeah, you know all of that sort of paled into uh, insignificance um, uh, because of the academic uh, atmosphere at stanford and uh, again i'll tell you a little you know just a, a small incident when uh, uh, i i went to stanford i had studied from professor hongren's uh, cost accounting textbook in india and so i see this person who is a giant figure in the field and um, I, you know he comes up shakes my hand and says you know i'm chuck and you know i'm totally taken aback i uh, <laughs> know him as professor hongren and uh, right. uh, I, i can tell you to this day that it took me a while to uh, call him that but i think what was fantastic was the easy informal close relationship right. among faculty you know position didn't matter only ideas did uh, the academic training was uh, excellent we were encouraged to work on big problems and more than the financial support sort of was the encouragement and support we got from uh, intellectually and that part of the culture was truly special so fantastic time so you know uh, shikant i wanted to ask you this question there are lots of our viewers here who aspire to uh, go to america for higher studies uh, there are lots of lots of them who are already on their way or they be viewers who are uh, watching you from across the world uh, you know there's this label often given to indian education that it's not innovative it doesn't foster creative thinking or critical thinking uh, yet when indian students go out they do extremely well no matter which university or which part of the world they get to they're successful like you and there are many other examples not just in universities but in you know corporations across the world what is that alchemy or what is the thing which in india uh you know makes indian successful despite what people criticize our education system for also we never appear we always hear that we don't appear in the qs rankings or the times higher education rankings uh all our universities are you know 150 or you know somewhere in squeezing into the top couple of 100 yeah. yet we have people like you well you know, and, and not me uh, 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 of course or many many uh, many others and uh, uh, you know i i i think there are several uh, it's a it's a very interesting point and uh, uh, one that uh, you know we the more, no easy answers but i think there are many reasons why uh, people uh, have gone out and done uh, well in the way they have and i, I also believe that of course we can take uh, terrific examples shift being an example in india as you were mentioning earlier about you know amazing things inside india so uh, first of course is just their brilliance uh, talent and inner drive you know we know uh, you know even as i've done some of my work on design thinking and innovation and i do believe that you can get much better at it i we obviously know there's a distribution of talent and there is no question that uh, that brilliance talent and inner drive uh, uh, has uh, is, is part of the story i think part of the story is that they are uh, uh, inherently curious you know humble they have uh, uh, you know in even in the education system they've had the opportunity to have outstanding teachers as i did and who really taught me how to learn you know not just the knowledge but uh, how to learn so and i think the very best institutions in india are really very good uh, in the education they impart perhaps not in the research they do uh, apropos your question around uh, rankings but um, you know if i think back on the education i had at i am ahmedabad uh, and what it did as i was describing earlier uh, truly special and um, you also because uh, in these institutions you get to meet other very talented individuals you get to learn from them so you're you're suddenly in this mix and in this uh, uh, atmosphere where you are uh, constantly uh, you know prompted to think about uh, different things and uh, uh, think more deeply and more carefully um i think many of us came from homes where uh, the atmosphere was such that education uh, was uh, important and i can certainly say from my own experience and several others that i know uh, you know the co curricular and extra curricular activities that we were engaged in also developed our uh, uh, leadership and and teamwork and so and having said all of that uh, sort of you're going back a little bit in terms of uh, certainly my history and others of of the of the people that you were talking about 
as i see what's happening in education today including the work being done by the foundation and several others uh, you know it's just is just getting better and better so i remain hopeful and optimistic shikant i want to switch gears and talk a little bit about your work right you started life of course you were uh, you studied mathematics you studied economics you studied statistics you studied finance and i don't know what else uh, you know you really did you know you're a polymath if uh, i can call you that uh but then you you moved and started paying more emphasis on design thinking and innovation you're the chair of harvard's uh, innovation lab uh you're also you know you've done in some incredible work in design thinking for our viewers here can you demystify design thinking into what it's all about and then the, my follow on question is that if you would apply some of those principles of what you do in design thinking to look at what the world is facing today and i'm not necessarily only going to talk covid but i'm going to talk post covid what would you do and you apply that framework uh to the the problem that you're facing in the world so two parts demystify design thinking tell us how we can apply it to solving our problems in in our current life and our current world so uh design thinking uh, is a way of uh, thinking uh, innovatively and uh, creatively about uh, uh, difficult problems and all it says is that um, uh, you know you can think about these wicked problems challenging problems through a series of steps right. and what are those steps uh, first uh, and and of course when you it, i'll try to demystify it as you say but i have even as i say that i'm going to argue that you know getting a, a, a level of competence in each of these steps is not uh, not 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 immediate not obvious requires a lot of practice but uh, the first is observing with empathy you know how do you walk in somebody else's shoes how do you uh, have insights about uh, why things are happening in the way they do and you know just given the biases that we have and the way we come at problems um, it's not not always easy but uh, that's sort of the first step second is to uh, reframe problems you don't just take the problem the way it is given to you but you imagine how might you uh, reframe it you may be in a particular business uh, you know you're in uh, uh, let's say a, a, a particular uh, medical device business and you're thinking you know you're selling a product well you say what if i defined it not as selling a product but as trying to come up with a patient solution so how might i think about the patient journey map and therefore how might i now rethink what it is that uh, that i am doing the next step is to generate ideas and what might be counter intuitive here uh, saurav is that uh, and and a, a combination of design thinking and innovative problem solving says that generating ideas can be done uh, systematically so it's not uh, there is of course the tools of brainstorming that uh, most of our uh, uh, viewers are familiar with but there are also tools where you can generate ideas systematically and right. the basic theory behind why you can generate ideas systematically is that uh, we ha have certain amounts of fixedness in how we think so we refer to it as either functional fixedness structural fixedness relational fixedness cognitive fixedness i have a view i think about a particular problem in a particular way and that's very helpful in many things that we do but when it comes to innovating i got a kind of break away from that fixedness i've got to change right. how i think and there are marvelous tools that you can use to actually do it and so what design thinking and innovative problem solving would do is to ideate come up with uh, different uh, ideas and then you try to uh, prototype it and uh, uh, you know experiment with it uh, to come up with a solution so we refer to that as rapid prototyping that eventually then leads to a solution so those are the steps in design thinking um, uh, saurav and uh, to your a question around this crisis and uh, you know what it will uh, what it will do and i think there are there is no question that uh, uh, what it has uh, and as you apply some of that kind of thinking because it's a class where it's a complicated problem and now i want to really rethink a lot of what it is that uh, we are doing and in my mind just two or three quick points and then uh, we can obviously follow up uh, 
it has accelerated tremendously the move to uh, digital and online technology so what would have taken two to three years to happen is now happening in months and yeah. it's happening across uh, businesses organizations functions so just to give you one example of each in the telecommunication business i don't know if we would need these kind of large call centers that we've uh, uh, you know always had uh, in medicine i don't know if as a result of telemedicine suddenly healthcare services become available to people right. who did not have access to it um, i can imagine in sales uh, uh, people trying to now uh, think about more uh, uh, digital uh, solutions now right. there is no question that in some industries i think of hospitality restaurants uh, leisure uh, airlines you know it will take longer to recover not for any other reason but because of the psychological worry uh, that consumers have but as we get past uh, some of those stages some of what i have mentioned earlier uh, will yeah. continue to play a role so it has just spurred a lot of innovation very quickly well, thank you that's interesting i i mean I i'm sure our viewers will take away something of that framework and i'm sure there's lots of material that they can they can refer to but you know as you rightly said every crisis brings an opportunity if you have put the design thinking hat on then you can perhaps come to solutions which are far reaching and probably uh, covid will alter our lives much more than the financial crisis so the dot com you know bust that we had and several other crises in the past even probably even the world war or even the great depression now we've got yeah. lots of questions coming right in shrikant so we're going to dive into the questions of the audience yeah. uh so here's a question asked by a lot of people uh, how will the role of teachers and educators change in the new online and digital world this has been asked by neeru kumari jha shushmita mukherjee mohammad tahir ansari and also by ghansham das i know you uh, you have led this online transition at harvard at a record pace and you've earned yourself quite a reputation there shrikant so yeah. you know quick answer quick answer to this one it's an okay. easy one for you <laughs> uh, well well you know uh, uh, always always interesting to uh, uh, ponder these kinds of questions uh, sort of so i think it is uh, as you said you know as we went uh, transition to online many valuable skills capabilities and competencies uh, were developed um and 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 are continuing to be developed so as we go forward i actually do think that we will end up in a uh, in a hybrid world um and let me give you just four quick examples of uh, where how i feel this will uh, actually benefit much much of it coming from the work that we're already uh, doing here at hbs so first is how do i identify areas where learners can benefit from learning at their own pace and style by the way i take is given that the purpose of education is to uh you know make learning engaging uh, you know get people give people the joy of learning and help them learn how to learn so i take that as given but in many areas where i want people to learn at their own pace i can think in in the fields i'm familiar with quantitative methods uh, data analytics finance and accounting and the ability to do one on one teaching to identify where people have problems to help them to go back and rewind if you will and uh, and learn at their uh, in a way that suits their learning style is a huge advantage that we're getting from the current uh, uh, environment now we'll have to not do the same things is not just give a video and and do it for instance in uh, harvard business school online we're actually teaching what is called asynchronously in the example that i just gave uh, using cases and pre assigned questions where students discuss amongst themselves without a professor so i think we're getting very innovative in how we do it second example i'd give is where a geographic uh, dispersion provides a learning benefit and we're trying to uh, think of many ways in which we could take so imagine students in different parts of the world looking at a common problem and identifying what was different about those particular regions so that they can then share their uh, learnings and uh, collaboration uh, collaborate well. and understanding yeah. different uh, yeah. contexts out of so uh, a huge advantage and in thinking about it from the point of view of rethinking the mba that you were referring to earlier as well uh, uh, sort of uh, you know we always thought about experiential experiential learning and innovative thinking as important things that we should do as educators but you know the way we would do it is you sit in class and then you go and experience but experiential learning is trying to have learning and experience happen at the same time and as these technologies develop 
I can imagine people, you know, being at a distance and working on a problem and yet being connected to the learning in powerful right. ways. So I just think that what's going to come out of this from an education point of view, and I'm very confident that we'll uh, embrace it. It's going to result in the classroom of the future. It's going to result in more access to education and it's going to result in more quality education. So all aspects. And a lot of, and a lot of people wanting to be educated as a result of gr a greater library and online resources. In fact, I, I, I read a report yesterday that Ramachandra Guha, the historian, yeah. uh, has said that you know one of the benefits for him is that He'd never gone online and done much of this, but he's now learning about public health and he's learning about a bunch of things about digital literacy and things, which he is, as a historian, for him, it's a, it's a, it's a move forward. So I think uh, in many ways, it's going to alter our lives quite dramatically. Now, there are a couple of other questions I quickly want to get to in yep. the interest of time. There's a question on innovation and yep. wearing among when you have many hats, so maybe take one hat off and put the innovation hat on. Uh, yep. Shrikant, I'm used to juggling it is uh, a question from M. Menon, which says, while India is pretty good at frugal innovation, Jugal, et cetera, why yeah. do we lag behind in radical innovation? You know, I'll give two answers to that question, uh, uh, Saurav. Uh, you know, a, a good uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Amar Bide, wrote this book about um, venturesome consumers. And what that refers to uh, is the idea that uh, what prompts a lot of these radical innovations is that uh, they have a market, and you can go into many reasons why this is the case. So uh, they have a market where when something, uh, and just remember what happened when, you know, the first computer comes out or the first, uh, uh, you know, phone comes out, you know, I, you know, the prices are crazy, you know, they're high, but there are people uh, very keen on trying to get it. So it may be as much to do with what's happening on the consumer side as it is happening on the producer side. And when you have a society that is very willing to try things, knowing that it may not work, uh, uh, you know, ends up uh, uh, resulting in uh, much more radical innovation just because, uh, you know, people are uh, much more willing to try things that are different. And it certainly helps an entrepreneur uh, when they're in that mix. Of course, it has also got to do with the resources that are uh, available. And, and so I was referring to the market side, now moving to the producer side. And in the end, sort of my belief is that, uh, you know, very often these are these small steps in innovation that occur that eventually lead to a big breakthrough. So if you look at the Apple iPhone, you know, if you think about the individual components that went into that innovation, it wasn't as if it was, uh, uh, we didn't know many of the technologies that got used in it. It was the way in which it was combined and how it met an important user need uh, that then resulted in that kind of innovation. So, and I also think, uh, Shikan, the, the ecosystem has to be supportive, right? I mean, America has this enormous benefit of an ecosystem. The Chinese Supply chains were built over decades of reform and infrastructure investments. Uh, it's not just innovation. I think in India, our innovation is more about how do you get around the <laughs> absence of you know, infrastructure, financing, and tools. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think it's very contextual, isn't it? It is. It is. And, and by the way, I think your points are very well taken, Saurav, also, because if you look at where those innovations have occurred, even if I take the U.S. example, it is a little different in Silicon Valley, for instance, if you're referring to innovation uh, uh, you know, of right. the types that we were just describing, than it is in other parts. So it is that ecosystem that uh, by, by in, in a large way helps. So I have a question here, which is coming back to education, and I'll link it up to a question I want to ask with a question that uh, Raja Gopal Venkatraman wants to ask. So, you know, you wrote this seminal work, and this is also for our viewers to know, that Srikant has written a seminal piece of work, which is called Rethinking the MBA. And for those of who are either MBA aspirants or are, you know, have already got an MBA or are even are interested, it, it kind of resets the context in terms of the MBA itself, how we should think about it. In fact, we at the Shivnada University at the School of Management and Entrepreneurship have incorporate some of those thinking principles into uh, the university is maybe you may want to talk a little bit not just about the MBA but on a broader subject of education reform itself and I'm linking it up to Rajagopal Venkatraman's question 
which is how do we bring transformation in Indian schools where unfortunately rote learning and exam orientation approach is predominant over promoting experiential learning and innovation skills in children? No, I think it's a it's a it's an important question, uh, Saurav. And um, uh, you know, I I, I think I, I, as I said, I'm I, I look at a number of schools that have now being are being started where this is uh, uh, clearly happening. And by the way, if one thinks about the kind of online uh, revolution that's occurring in uh, uh, in uh, education at, uh, at at the K to twelve level. Uh, that is also causing people to uh, things uh, right. uh, uh, see things differently. I had the, the privilege of, uh, um, uh, you know, being on a panel with Ravindran and um, uh, Sal, uh, Sal Khan here around the Khan Academy and, you know, the kinds of things they're doing. So more of it is happening. I think at a very basic level, uh, Saurav, uh, there are there is, of course, a body of knowledge, and this is very much connected to what we wrote in, uh, uh, in our book on Knowing, Doing, and Being. Uh, 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 and each one of them requires a bit of a shift, by the way. Right. So this is not not even different, even in management education. And that's that was the purpose of rethinking the MBA. How do you change know, from knowing skills to thinking skills? So that's sort of the one shift that uh, needs to occur. Um, how do you and and I think it's again the fixedness and how do you how do you begin to see these uh, uh, skills? Because knowledge is changing so fast. Uh, that it is uh, the ability to learn how to learn that is going to be uh, important. You know, I, 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 I'm often asked uh, if I think about Harvard, what are distinctive characteristics of it? And this would be sort of uh, a top of mind. It's the it's the ability to get students to constantly learn how to learn. Uh, doing skills are important because they teach. There's a certain kind of learning that comes from uh, uh, from it as the uh, questioner is uh, was mentioning around uh, how do you uh, you know experience certain things and what kind of knowledge do you get from that and innovation is is clearly one way you are uh, it's so exciting in terms of trying to think about something new and different uh, and how do how does one uh, encourage that so i think uh, you know, I'm not against knowing, and and uh, and uh, I'm I'm always a fan of. Of course, there is a body of knowledge that my co concern is stopping there. And so, even when right. we wrote about rethinking the MBA, how do you go towards thinking? How do you go towards de doing? And then, of course, very important for us was being uh, uh, sort of. So it's not just uh, innovation and experiential learning, but how do you develop and uh, transform people to uh, uh, you know uh, have impact and lead and have good values as they act. OK. So before I take on uh, some audience questions, I want to ask you a question which comes out of a speech you gave at the IM Calcutta Convocation recently. And you know, uh, it sometimes is fashionable to quote Gandhi, and sometimes it's not. But I think you know, in, during this crisis time, uh, there are not many people who've been invoking Gandhi's name, right? You invoke his name as a person, uh, you know, as part of your theme also of uh, how businesses should be more responsive and more socially responsible. Uh, how do you think Gandhi would have reacted to a situation like this? What would be his contextual relevance, uh, Shrikant? So, yeah, uh, uh, you know, in the speech that you referred to at the IIM uh, Calcutta Convocation uh, two years uh, ago, um, you know, I'm, uh, uh, of course, uh, as you as you know from the background that you asked, uh, very uh, heavily influenced by Gandhiji because uh, of my father. And uh, on the second floor of uh, Hawes Hall, which is on the Harvard Business School campus, there's a beautiful portrait of uh, Gandhiji. And below it, um, you know, are his seven deadly sins. And I've always yeah. felt that if you look at what those sins were, and I'll just, uh, for the benefit of the audience, just uh, mention it because they're so beautiful. Um, wealth without work, mm -hmm. pleasure without conscience, right. knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, worship without sacrifice, and politics without principles. Now, if you think Very about, right. if you think about the items on the left of that, uh, on the on the first part of that list, uh, Saurav, they're all about uh, economic growth and the keys to human progress. Just think of those words: knowledge, science, commerce, wealth. They're all about human progress, and 
And Gandhiji was never fond of any kind of state-controlled production. He always believed that, uh, you know, in freedom, in the in, in the goodness of people. Uh, and then you think about the words at the end of each of those uh, uh, comments, and they have to do with character and humanity and morality and work and conscience. And these are the core principles and human values that underlie uh, social justice. And so... Yeah. What Gandhiji was trying to tell us is that, uh, as, he's, as he's saying, that in the, uh, certainly in my interpretation of what he's saying here, is yes, we should power the engines of commerce to create wealth and uh, uh, you know, use science, but without taking advantage of people, without uh, by always acting ethically, uh, by being aware of the privileges we uh, enjoy. So each one of these, I think, is tremendous significance for the crisis we're going through. In fact, in some way, at least to some extent, it's precisely this tension that is causing us to worry about, uh, should we open up the economy or should we focus more on social justice? Because as you know, certainly in the US, sort of, uh, this crisis has unfortunately affected uh, those of us who cannot so comfortably be sheltered at home. And uh, so there is clearly an aspect of that uh, happening in this crisis. And what I take away as the lesson of Gandhi, as in India too, as in India too. What I take away from the lesson of Gandhiji here is that uh, you have to think about this much more creative. Once you pose this as either or, I think, uh, and and just look at his life and look at the amazing innovations that he came up with. You know, you think about ahimsa and you think about satyagraha and you think about nonviolence and even in this case, thinking about in the context of commerce, and I, I say this often when talking about rethinking the MBA, uh, the idea that the rich should be the trustees of the poor, these are powerful ideas. They are definitely a little bit uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, imbued with a certain amount of idealism, but we have seen glorious examples of people uh, practicing it, but it will require that kind of innovative thinking, even right. in this current crisis, as we think about uh, the issues that we confront. So Shikhan, I'm going to bunch up a couple of last questions as we as we reach the 45 minute mark on our conversation today. Uh, we have a bunch of questions here. You know, one that's come about the quality of research determines the quality of teaching, and the quality of teaching determines the quality of students attracted from different parts of the world. Uh, you know, how is it that the U.S. universities invest a lot of research, and you know, uh, the whole question is why Indian universities cannot do that? So it's a resource issue. That's one question coming from Srinivas Rao. Uh, Bongarala. There's a question from Piyush Mehta, which also says, how do you visualize an on online platform in India post-COVID where the large percentage of the population is rural? Once more, a resource question, infrastructure reaching the poor and the rural areas where, you know, India does definitely have a shortage and a scarcity. Uh, and then, of course, there's another question from Anonymous, which talks about online education may cause a divide because there will be the, the rich versus poor, those with access without those with access. So a bunch of questions from different people, but maybe in, in, in a quick summary of, you know, uh, access, inability to do that, rich versus poor, rural versus urban, if you can just give us a quick answer. Uh, you know, on research and teaching first, Saurav, I, I, I have always felt that, uh, uh, you know, the better, the uh, particularly if you believe in my uh, argument that what education is all about is learning how to learn, uh, uh, you know, the you don't have to be a, uh, you don't have to be a scholar or a researcher, but you have to be able to consume research in order to teach well, because you are trying to be, you're trying to teach that way of critical thinking. What is the research saying, not saying, and how should you think about it? So I always have thought about research and teaching as more synergistic than uh, uh, than than not. On the rural versus urban, rich versus poor, important question. But I think you always try to compare it to the alternatives. You know, today it's not that the, those folks have access to high quality education, sort of, right. even as we as we sit here. And I think online education has the best hope of being able to change that. It does mean, um, you know, some amount of resource allocation, but it's far lower than the resource allocation. And I don't even know if we would get there in terms of getting teachers and schools built and, uh, you know, access to these kind of schools right. uh, and teachers. So uh, I actually think it will bridge that divide. There is no question that there is a digital divide. Uh, but I actually think it'll bridge it. it uh, you have a much greater opportunity of bridging it through these technologies uh, than you had without them. Yeah, and we, and you know we have one of the lowest telecom costs in the world, and 
we hope that those costs remain under control in the post-COVID era as well. And therefore, there is hope as 5G rolls out, as people think about longer-term technologies. If anything, I think online education, online telehealth, all the themes that you mentioned may be able to converge on platforms which can bring more access and spread, if you like, more development rather than deny it. Uh, you know, and, uh, Shrikant, yeah, sorry. You know, and I was just going to say that it's important to recognize that it is both reach and quality, Saurabh, Absolutely. because you don't only want to focus on reach, it's reach and quality and far better chance of us getting there with uh, embracing these technologies than by uh, other means. Shrikant, that was a riveting conversation. Thank you for this very wide sweep, walking us through your uh, early childhood and your growing up years in India, your fascinating journey to America. You've been an inspiration for a lot of people. You are not just an academic and a teacher, but a thinker, uh, someone who has actually pushed the frontiers of knowledge. Uh, you've been on boards where you help them think through uh, serious challenges in terms of solving their business problems. And what's most important is that you retained your connections to India and you work with a lot of institutions here. You work with our foundation as well. Uh, thank you ever so much for this conversation. I'm sure our viewers and those uh, who have not been able to watch this, you will be able to watch this uh, later on, on, the, on the same platform, the recording of this conversation. So thank you again. Have a wonderful day, Shrikant. And thank you to all our viewers from across the world for having tuned in to listen to Shrikant Datar. Uh, one of the most fascinating conversations uh, that one can ever have. Thank you again, Shrikant, and have a wonderful thank, day. Thank you very much, Saurabh. It was an absolute privilege and pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.